this tutorial um, aims to learn how to uh, plot solutions from the ROMS model. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to copy uh, from the user's GFD root uh, home directory a folder called ROMS plotting. So I'm going to copy it here in my home folder. Then I'm going to go into ROMS plotting and I'm going to work with this uh, MATLAB script that has a whole bunch of different routines uh, for plotting. So let's open this. And this is meant to be an example of how to work with this. So the, the, the grid that we're going to work with here is the grid from uh, Ecosys, which is a simulation of the simple upwelling ecosystem. And uh, so let me fire up MATLAB here. And um, this, uh, this particular output is, is on the system. So no, no worry for that. So let's uh, first load the grid here. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make a figure here uh, using the mfig command. And I'm going to make a figure of the actual uh, bathymetry of the grid with this using the rnt plcm grdh. So let's do that. And so here we are. You're probably already familiar with this routine. So this is actually uh, building you know, a, a grid, a, a plot of the bathymetry. Now, as you notice, there's an option here, and this option controls the type of shading that you want. So, for example, if you want to, if you want to do a publication quality, you can use the contouring, which is actually nicer, and you can replot the same plot now uh, with the contour option, and you can see that now it's a lot smoother, a lot nicer, and so this is now it's a contour figure. You can also use other types of option shading. For example, instead of using flat, you could use interp. And uh, again, you can plot this in. So these are just different ways of, of plotting uh, the same solution. Now, RNT PLCM is, is one command that uses this kind of uh, you know, mapping toolbox called MMAP, which you can look on the cluster. It's called M MMAP. Uh, sorry, help MMAP, uh, which is um, this particular toolbox here from Rich Palovitz. And you know here these are all the functions that that are contained in in this uh, toolbox, and typically is used to do these uh, geographical mapping things. On the other hand, if you if you just want to plot, you know something without using that toolbox, you can use the same routine, like RNT PLC. And uh, in this case, you don't have the option here, and you can plot it like this, and this will create a more simplified version of the plot, where this is the bathymetry again, and and this is just a color scheme. And this now is actually plotted uh, just as a regular MATLAB plot. And so as you can see, if I move or stretch the figure, uh, the plot uh, axis ratio of the axis changes, whether if I use the other, the other routine, um, like this one, the aspect ratio is actually already uh, is constrained to be a Mercator projector. So no matter how you, you change the figure, the aspect ratio of the axis will never change. Okay, so that's kind of uh, an interesting property of this uh, toolbox. Okay, so things that I can plot, I have my GRD array, which is the grid here, and I can plot things like the, um, for example, the dimension, the distances in the x direction, and this is going to be just 1 over grd.pm. Uh, this is going to be in meters. If I divide that by 1,000, it's going to be in kilometers, and this is going to tell me the average resolution of the grid in one of the direction. And so this is what it looks like. And you can see that the average resolution is approximately around 20 kilometers for this particular uh, model run. Uh, so again, an alternative way to, to use is also, you, we, we talk about the RNT PLC. You also have something called RNT PLC2, um, which is, again, a, a similar you know, way of plotting. But um, OK, very good. So now we're going to load the output of our model. And the way that we do that is we use First, we, we, we collect the files that contain the output by using this routine RNT get file names. We put the directory where the output is contained, and then you know a, a, a suffix here, prefix, that tells us you know how the output files are called. Uh, so now files has basically all the all the files of the run. These are 12 files so far, and uh, you can see that they all contain this AVG uh, prefix, and that's why in the when I loaded the files, I introduced this AVG prefix here. Let me just make this a little bit more uh, clear. So I just uh, okay. So you can see here, I basically just put a common denominator 
uh, that is contained by all the files. Okay, once we have the files, I'm going to as, you know create a CTL file, which is a, a CTL structure array, which is basically a map of all the output. And I do here, and this one is done by executing the second line here. And so now the CTL basically tells me that I have about 140, you know, backwards. Uh, and it basically is a map that goes from the from the time from each time snapshot uh, to the file. So I don't have to worry about, for example, where the output of a particular month is. I can just do, for example, CTL dot month. Here I have virus month, and I can, for example, I can find find CTL dot month uh, equals five. Okay, this is the month of uh, of uh, what is it May. And so here, basically, I find all the snapshots that contain, you know, the month five. And you can, these snapshots are contained actually in different files, but I don't have to open every single file. I can just, you know, once I know the index that I want, I can use the command rnt load var of ctl comma en comma, say I want to load the, the sea surface height of the model. And here, by doing that, I can load instantaneously all the, all the month of May of the output. And so click this here. And so now size zeta, I've loaded basically this output. There's 12 realizations of this month. This is a 12 year run. In fact, these are monthly averages. And so now I can just plot, for example, the monthly, the mean sea surface height, you know, for the month of, um, of May. So I can just do that. Zeta comma, click the mean in the third index and then GOD. And let's, the option. And so this is the mean sea surface height. And this is a, in case of the sea surface height, you have this uh, gradient here, which indicates that there's a southward flow. This is meant to be an upwelling eastern boundary current system along the California coast. So here you have a, the eastern boundary current going southward in this domain, consistent with the sea surface height. So this is the mean for May. <clears throat> Very good. Well, we can now use, uh, we have the CTL with all the maps. We can also make a movie of the sea surface height. And so the movie, we just uh, we do a loop, you know, for all the time snapshots that we have. We load the sea surface height at each time step. Uh, we decide to use the contouring shading, and then we just plot it, and then we put a fix the axis for that, and we put a title here. And the title uses the date string command here, uh, which is uh, basically converts the the MATLAB date num, which is contained in the CTL array, into an actual date. So, for example, if I do you know, the first uh, date num, that's February of year zero. If I do the last date num, that's September of year 11. Okay, so let's actually make a little movie here. Let's make this a little bit smaller. And um, let's take this stuff here. And uh, let's put it here and then we paste it in here. And so this is, you can see now, the development, the, the spin up of the model. This is the initial spin up. This is in year one. Here you can see the year going on, the months. Now you can see that every every year there's a seasonal cycle with the large anomalies developing up the coast and then they kind of spread out to the offshore and that's kind of repeats over and over again. This is a seasonal cycle stimulation and so that's you get this nice eddy field developing all around. Very good. The next step that we're going to do is uh, we're going to stop this movie. Uh, this model contains also biology uh, and so what we can do is we can make a similar movie for the phytoplankton. And here, this is the phytoplankton movie. And you can look, you know, all the details of that. But in general, I convert the phytoplankton into the log scale. And that's because the phytoplankton has an exponential growth. So if we do log, uh, we can capture the exponential growth into a linear scale, which is uh, what our eye kind of prefers. So this is now a movie of the phytoplankton. And you see, for example, uh, during the upwelling season, you have a strong band of phytoplankton developing at the coast and then it dies off and you get something offshore and then on and off again and so forth. And so in fact you see a very strong seasonal cycle. If we were interested what we could do here we could actually clear this one second uh, and in, we can plot uh, the phytoplankton again just one snapshot but using for example the RNT PLC2 command. Okay. And so this is now the phytoplankton. And now I can actually use a function called to, to if I suppose I wanted to plot a time series of the phytoplankton here at the coast, I can do 
i comma j i'm going to find the point of the matrix that is actually for the for the post i'm going to find point and then i give the grd which is the array and i want to find one point so i'm going to go here now i can point with my mouse so i want to find the ijs of the grid at this location so that's 41 32 and now i can actually load the whole time series of the phytoplankton for that particular grid and the way I do that is I use this command rnt load var seg p. I do ctl. I do 1 to 140 records. Then I want to load the phytoplankton. Okay. And I want to load the location ij on the grid. And then the surface, in this case the surface is grdn, which is the nth layer, the surface layer of the model. So I can do that. And now I can make a plot ctl.datenum, which is a measure of the time in the models, and the phytoplankton. And that's what it looks like. And now I can do date tick to put the time axis on the y axis. And so here, what you see very clearly is a seasonal cycle, you know, every year. It's not a regular seasonal cycle because the upwelling may change in that location due to eddy activity. And you, you could see, you know, this is the year on this side. So this is a simple way of plotting the seasonal cycle. We can actually plot the seasonal cycle in a normalized way, NN. This is just normalizes the seasonal cycle. And now we can load, for example, the temperature instead of the phytoplankton and see how the phytoplankton is modulated with the temperature cycle, which is a measure also of the, of the amount of upwelling. And so I'm going to load now the temperature at that same point. OK, I'm going to hold on and plot the temperature normalized again so that I can compare it and if I do that of course there's a mean involved here so I can just uh, you could see that uh, there's a seasonality also in the temperature that more or less corresponds with the seasonality in the in the phytoplankton okay very good um, so what else can we do well as you know the model works on sigma coordinates so if I wanted to for example to plot um, uh, you know, the model temperature, say, at the surface. Let's see if I take the temperature at the surface. Let's say I take the temperature just at the surface. So here I'm going to take all GRD dot LP, which is all the points in the, in the X direction and all the points in the, in, the, in the Y direction. And suppose that I'm only going to extract like a record, uh, say the last record, 140. Okay. And so let's load the temperature here. And I'm going to clear this and just make a map of that. Temp, comma, uh, GRD, comma, opt. Okay, so this is the temperature now at the surface. Okay, and you, you could see the upwelling here and the warm temperature offshore and so forth. Now, suppose that I wanted to plot now the temperature in the below the surface. Now, the problem with that is that this is in sigma layer. So, for example, if I use, instead of taking the last layer, I take like 10 layers below and I plot this thing. What you typically will find is a very weird structure in the temperature in that you know, you're really looking at a layer that is following the topography. So it's actually not a constant depth. So one thing that I can do is I can convert this temperature. For example, suppose I load the whole temperature field, not just uh, the surface. Okay. So actually, let's use what's in the plot here. So I'm going to load the whole temperature field and also the free surface. I'm going to do that. And now what I want to do is this temperature field here is actually on the S-coordinate system, and I want to convert it into the Z-coordinate system. So the way I do that, first I compute the depth of the sigma coordinate layers by using this function, so RNT set depth, so I'm going to do that. Okay, and then I can, uh, I'm going to decide that I want to extract the temperature at different depths, say 50 meters, 100, 200, and 1,000 meters. So I define that, oops, sorry, I define that here. And then I have this function here called rnt to z, which takes as input the temperature, the depth of the sigma layers, and the depth at which I want to extract constant depth uh, profiles of temperature. And so I just do that here. Seven. Okay. And now I can plot, for example, the temperature at one, two, three, four, the thousand meters. Okay. So let's make a figure here. And this is what it looks like. As you can see now. You have the cold water coming from the subpolar region here and the warm waters in the tropics. And this is 1,000 meters. And, of course, you don't have anything close to the coast because, you know, there's this, uh, this the bathymetry here. 
if I want to look at a, a shallower temperature, let's uh, say, uh, uh, let's see, say at 100 meters, which is the second index here, uh, this is what it looks like. And you can see the cold temperature here associated with the upwelling and warmer temperature offshore. So that's just one way. Uh, it's another function that uh, helps you to extract or convert things uh, from the S coordinate to the Z coordinate. You may also want to extract things, say, from, uh, from the S coordinate to isopycnals. We often like to plot things in constant isopycnals. So the way to do, let's say that we want to convert salt. So let's load the salinity in the model for like a time snapshot 20. And we're going to compute the density using the temperature, salinity, and the depth of the sigma layer. Okay, so we do that. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to convert, we're going to estimate, you know, the, 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 depth, uh, the depth of the isopycnal. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to take, we're going to estimate the depth of the isopycnal you know, at these 50, 100, and 200 meters. Okay, and we're going to look at the isopycnal, you know, how this particular isopycnal, um, okay. So what really this is, this is we have converted now density into, into, um, into a z-grid. So this would be the, the density profile actually at the, uh, Number, index number four here would be a depth of about a thousand meters minus thousand meters. Now suppose that we want to compute the following isopycnals here. We want to compute a profile, you know, or, or the field at these particular isopycnal depths. So let's define the isopycnals. And we can use then a similar function where we compute the depth of these isopycnals. In this case, now we, we still use R and T to Z, but we pass now the depth of the sigma layers now density becomes our vertical coordinate, and then we we, we put it, we put down the cord the, the density uh, that we want where we want to compute this stuff. So let's do that. So now we're computing these isopycnals here, and of course we can plot, uh, you know, one particular isopycnal. Say the isopycnals I say were twenty six point five. Iso z, and that would be index number three here. Okay. So this is just telling you now the depth of this isopycnal. You see it's very shallow close to the coast where you have the upwelling. It's minus 50 meters, and it's deeper offshore, uh, so meaning that you know there's a slant of the isopycnal. Of course, you can extract. This is I'm extracting the depth of the isopycnal, but if I wanted to, I could extract, for example, the salinity on that isopycnal. And the way I would do that is just here, instead of putting the depth of the sigma layers, I put salt, and, and now I can plot you know, the, the salinity. And of course, the same thing you see is that as this, as the, on this particular close to the coast here, you have the saltier water on the size of Picnol and, uh, and you know, more fresh water offshore. Okay, very good. Um, and in fact, these are these routines is exactly what they're computing. They're computing you know, the salinity, temperature, the density, and other things on a particular isopycnal. So let's do that. And the next thing that I can also compute is something called spice. Okay, and spice is really, uh, you know, it's a coordinate independent to density. And the way to interpret it is that high spice is typically associated with high temperature and high salinity. Okay, and low spice is typically uh, low temperature and low salinity. And so it is thought that on isopycnal, uh, you know, that are below the surface, below the diabatic mixing that happens at the surface, spice is actually can be interpreted as a conservative tracer. So let's compute spice here on, on uh, you know, on the S coordinate system. And now let's let's convert it onto the isopycnals. Okay, and now let's plot actually the spice on a very deep isopycnal. For example, the the last one, uh, iso spice four. Iso spice. And uh, let's look at it. And so what you see here is something interesting. You see the the, the low spice waters from the from the subtropics that are being abducted downstream. These are typically waters that are uh, cold and fresh. And here you could see in the you know the saltier and warmer waters of subtropical gyres that are being abducted along this isopycnal here and also uh, up the coast you know from the southern boundary. Okay, so that's all consistent uh, with the, this particular uh, geographical region. 
Other things that we can compute is the Bernoulli stream function, which is really the pressure on a particular isothermal, and so we can do that by just uh, by giving this as an input. And so let's do that, and um, and so in this case, uh, we computed the Bernoulli stream function. Uh, let's see on which layers. Uh, uh, this would be on, uh, I think, I believe on isothermal. 30. Okay, this is a, on a density surface equal to 30. Okay, this is where you put the isothermal uh, number. Okay, here we use 25, 26, 27. Here I'm looking at uh, at 30. And um, so let's plot the the B function here, which is the Bernoulli stream function. And this is what it looks like. And this typically is an indication of the flow field. So in this case, you know, you see the presence of these eddies. So most of the circulation here at this depth of isopic noise is controlled by uh, by these uh, by these eddies eddy type features. Uh, so that's very good. Uh, other things that we can plot are the velocity field. So we're going to load the velocity field and use this routine called RNT PL back to plot it. So let's do that. Um, so I'm plotting both velocity, and so this is you know kind of uh, the the vectors of velocity. Now in this case, you know, maybe I want to make the vectors closer, so let's uh, use, uh, uh, you know, less, you know, vectors to be closer. And you can modify this parameter. The, the bigger it is, the more spacing you have a vector, the smaller it is, the less spacing. And so you can intensify as much as you want. And so this is just showing you a velocity profile, you know, where, you know, you can see the features of some eddy scale features and so forth. In fact, we can make this a little bit bigger. So that we can clearly see again, you know, the, the structure uh, of this thing. Uh, in principle, we could also, instead of loading one snapshot, we can load the mean, uh, and that's that would be done by just doing uh, uh, one to uh, 140, which is all the records, and this may take some time. And then we can load v here, one to 140. Okay. Then we can say that u equals mean of u comma four. There's four elements in this matrix, the time being the fourth one. It's because we have x, y, z, and time. We do that. So now we computed the mean, and now we can plot the mean, you know, for for the velocity field. And again, uh, so this is the mean, and and what you see mostly is a at the surface a large flow here. And, and so this is just a mean, a kind of a mean southward flow, but you also find that there's some mean Ekman flow uh, associated with the upwelling winds, which are driving this direction, which are, which are blowing in this direction. So you have a, like a, an, an Ekman flow as well. So this is a combination of geostrophic and Ekman. And, and this is the amplitude. This is a, these currents are about 0.2 meters per second. Okay, the red ones. Okay, very good. Uh, other things that we can do is we can compute, actually separate the geostrophic and agiostrophic component in this case, meaning the Ekman from the geostrophic one. And this can be done by computing the geostrophic flow of the model using the exact, um, you know, the exact um, uh, pressure gradient routine of the model. And so uh, let's do uh, that for this particular temperature salinity. Okay, uh, so let me do that. Okay, so I compute that, and um, oops, let me just go by. And actually, here we are working on on a particular time index. So let's use the time index twenty so that it's consistent. Okay, so this is a geostrophic flow for that particular uh, for that particular time, and this routine gets as input also. You know the, all these elements, which is the depth of the signal layer, the density field. You know that's what it uses, and the sea surface height. And the sea surface height is important because this is an absolute geostrophic flow reference to the particular elevation of the sea surface height. Uh, there's two, I guess. Um, yeah, this is uh, so. Now we can just plot this in a figure. Okay. Again, we, we may want to make this a little bit. So this is just trophic flow uh, of this um, of this thing, and, and we can compare that with uh, well, we can actually now look at the agiostrophic component. 
this is now the agiostrophic component. And again, let's uh, make this. Uh, and so you can clearly see that if you compare the agiostrophic component with the geostrophic component, oops, sorry, let me plot again the geostrophic component. Uh, this was the, this is the agiostrophic component. Oops, sorry guys. We want to plot the geostrophic component now. There we go. Okay, so this is the geostrophic component. Okay, you see it has all the eddy scale circulation. And this is the agiostrophic component, which is still very strong. You see it's 0.2 in this case. And this you can see is more uniform, and this is really just wind driven. This is the Ekman flow, so it's really directed in this case away from the coast, as you would expect. It's pretty strong, it's 0.25, okay? And you can compare with the 0.4, which is the geostrophic eddies here that you see embedded. So, so the sum of these two is the total field, and, and, and this is the geostrophic component, this is the agiostrophic or Ekman component. Okay, so let's close all the figures. And at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to just do some vertical sections, okay? And um, there's various ways to do vertical section. One simple way is to, for example, suppose you, let's plot the, the, the model grid again. MPPLCM of GOD dot H comma GOD. Suppose that we want to plot a section uh, along a particular line, you know, of a constant line. Uh, along the grid here, that's very easy to do. And uh, we just find, for example, approximate location, say approximately 33 north, okay. Um, 33, okay. Uh, lat R is bigger than 33. Okay, so we'll just find an index here, just the first one. Uh, F. Okay, so this is, we're gonna make a section across J equals 40. So if you count here, you're going to have j equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, until 40, and which is right here. Okay, and so we're going to do a section now that follows the grid along a constant j in the i direction, which is in this direction over here. Okay, so let's plot a profile. Uh, let's plot a profile of spice, for example. So let's clear this thing and plot that. So this is a profile of a spice, and... Uh, it's not very interesting, I guess. You see very high spice here at the surface here, but this is really not, uh, you know, get the surface and then low spice in the interior. Let's look at something that maybe makes more sense, like salt. Um, and so in the salinity, you see this fresh water here at the surface, and then saltier water in the subsurface. And if we zoom a little bit more towards the surface, uh, let's zoom here in the upper 500 meters, uh, what you see here is this core of fresh water, and this is actually the core of this uh, eastern boundary current, the California current, which is bringing uh, fresh water from the subtrop from the subpolar region into the subtropical this uh, subtropical region. So here you could see it very clearly the sign of that current uh, bringing down the water, and you can see that the current extends all the way up to say 300 meters and more. Okay, so that's like a vertical section. And you can always control the axis of your vertical section using set GCA Y limb. So, for example, you only want, you know, 0 to 500 meters. That's basically what the vertical section looks like. Okay. Another thing you can do is um, suppose that you want to have, uh, you know, a, a section that is across, you know, any particular, um, you know, along a particular transect. Okay. So for example, let's clean this and let's do RMT PL. Uh, let's plot salinity. First, let me just uh, So this is the salinity here at the surface. And suppose that you, here you see the freshwater intrusion. Suppose that you want to plot a section that does something like this, like a like a shape like this, or or suppose you want to follow the core here of the fresh water. So what I can do here is I can say um, x y equals g input. Let's say that I want to find three points, okay, on this map, to, or let's say four points to follow, you know, these coordinates. So now I can go here, and I can start. I want to start here. One, say, uh, two three, and four, okay? So now I took the coordinates of 
of those four points with this routine. So now I can I can I can say here plot x y and then let's put a black star. Okay, or actually let's plot a line through. So I suppose I want to plot a section that follows this line here. So I have the x y coordinate of that, and then all I, I can use this function called rnt section. And uh, all it needs is once you know the type of interpolation, which is cubic, the resolution. I'm going to use about 10 kilometers, although this grid is 20 kilometers, so let's shift this to 20 kilometers. Okay, and I'm going to do a three dimensional mask, and then I'm going to pass here, you know, uh, in this case I was passing phytoplankton, but let's, let's pass the salt here. Okay, and, and so I'm going to do another figure and plot a section along that region. And this is what the section looks like. Okay, so uh, you know, and this is the distance from the upstream point to the downstream points in kilometers, and this is the depth. Okay, and so now again, if we set the zoom in the upper surface, what you see is that oops, that along the path that we're following, right? This is the path that we're following. We're going from the intrusion of the fresh water to the less fresh water, and this is keep track here very well. You have the the fresh water here, and as you go further south, you know this fresh water is decreasing along the core uh, because of the lateral mixing with the other water from the subtropics that is present in this region over here. So, so this is all for this uh, plotting, and uh, you know this is just exercise, you know, by yourself. Okay, thank you very much.